So hi everyone, my name is uh, Tim. Um, I'm a Croatian designer. I currently work uh, at a New York agency called Five. Um, we do mobile design and development. We have offices in, in three cities and about uh, 100 people in the company. Um, and I split my time between Zagreb and New York and spending a lot of time on the airplane um, and on buses and trains and um, in coffee shops. Um, in Zagreb, I also teach at the School of Design in Zagreb. Um, I organize meetups on two continents, so uh, a meetup called Design First uh, in New York um, and IXDA Croatia in Zagreb. Uh, and this has been my route for um, the first like two weeks of May, so Sveiki. It's good, Sveiki, yeah. Okay. Thanks, Google. Uh, and I'm leaving in the morning early for uh, Washington. Uh, I'm going to have a um, client workshop there. I'm not going to talk about that today, but we practice kind of design sprints from you know, Google Ventures and everyone, so that it kind of fits nicely into this agile um, conference. And we can kind of chat uh, later on uh, a little bit more about that. Um, the typography and everything is a little bit scaled, which kind of you know horrifies me as a designer. So please don't do that. We couldn't kind of um, get the technical um, things to work to kind of display the the ratio. As I said, I work everywhere, and my colleagues love to make photos and videos of me working in weird places. This is a four hour bus drive from New York to DC or where we have a presentation next day. And this is me kind of finalizing the deck um, for next day's presentation. Uh, I've been working designing for screens for 13 years now. Um, started out as a web designer, as a webmaster, um, Ending up, you know, specializing in UX. Um, this year, in January, February, we design things for the Apple Watch. Um, so, kind of very interesting to see how um, how this has changed for like in 13 years. Um, my secret passion is taking screenshots of things that don't work or are broken or are funny or, you know, whatever. This is Foursquare in Serbia uh, before Apple Maps was available. As you can see, this is a very um, useful map to kind of navigate to that area. Um, it's very conceptualized. My students sometimes do projects like this, where it's like, you don't need the map, you just, know to, you just need to know where you are and where you're going. So that's interesting, um, but you know, navigating through um, bump roads of Belgrade was interesting. Um, I'm going to start by telling you a story from uh, Alan Cooper's famous book, uh, The Inmates Are Running the Asylum. Um, it's about a flight from mid 90s, an American Airlines flight that. Um, was flying from Miami to Columbia. It was like a regular daily flight. And um, prior to landing, the, the pilots uh, apply something that's called the um, radio navigation fix. It's basically something that triangulates the position of the plane and it helps them land. Um, they know, you know, this kind of fix is called Rozo, so they entered R. There was prob probably some kind of autocomplete or like something that kind of uh, like a drop down list that gave out all the fixes. And they pre selected the wrong one, they pre selected Romeo. Um, it was a radio fix for an for, um, airport which was 130 miles away, which was basically in the wrong direction. Um, and unfortunately, this plane landed into a mountain. And like almost the, the entire um, uh, crew and all the passengers um, died on this plane. Um, and then in the US, you have the National Transportation Board that does kind of the investigation. And what do they say? They say this was a human error. Um, if you're going to strip it down, of course it was a human error because kind of the person selected the wrong thing. But shouldn't this 
system, this computer, this flying computer became a little bit smarter? Why does it offer you something that's obviously um, very far away and that couldn't be applied to this specific um, airport or location? So kind of the, the question and the pledge of the day is, you know, can, the, can our applications do the hard work so we as the users don't have to? You know, we as designers and developers do the hard work so the users um, don't have to. So let's just kind of explore this um, you know, catchphrase, this very um, kind of word of the day, responsive, responsive design. Um, in 2007, obviously, the sales of kind of mobile and tablet devices started, uh, you know, going up. Um, in 2011, we had that uh, moment where there were more sold uh, mobile devices than PCs. And 2013, start of 2014, we had like what's called the mobile moment, with, where there's more more emails um, opened on a mobile device, where there's more more shopping done on a mobile device, um, where there's more tweets done on mobile devices. So basically, everything is um, done more on mobile devices than on kind of desktop, on, on laptops, on PCs. Um, and this inevitably, you know, made us kind of shrink um, the size, the viewport, the width of our designs, and kind of restructure and, and, and think about how the content will fit on um, smaller devices. Um, basically translating design from kind of one medium to another, a smaller one. Um, maybe, you know, some of us would think about responsive and adaptive. Um, if it was a room full of developers, like I think maybe it is currently, then we were thinking code, you know. What does it mean to kind of code a, a responsive website? I know when, when my agency that I started seven years back, when we started doing responsive, it was a headache for development. It was, you know, uh, previously we could kind of uh, use a smaller chunk for kind of front-end development, and now it just kind of enlarged about, you know, 50% of the time to kind of test for all these devices. And responsive web design, you know, when we say responsive, we always have this, you know, RWD, we think about, it's always kind of, you know, providing an optimal viewing experience, um, obviously having this kind of recipe, um, the layout, the images, um, and media queries. Um, and even Google, you know, just kind of two, three weeks back, um, it started putting a really strong focus on what they called mobile-friendly websites. Um, so basically, the websites that are you know, prepared for mobiles have a better rank um, on the results screen. And, and this is also Google's attempt to kind of fight um, with this um, kind of app atmosphere with the uh, with the apps that are very specific for kind of one need um, so people are doing less uh, traffic on the websites and what is responsive is it just kind of the you know the width and the height of the screen is that the screen size can we kind of think about this a little more um, the web is, you know, 95% um, typography. So how does it look like when we think about typography? When we start with, obviously, you know, mobile first, um, and then you have a lot of kind of examples which are not well where you where you go with the, you know, you start with the with the desktop version, and then you shrink it down, and then you have kind of large type that you know overflows um, that kind of takes up 50% of the screen and it's just not a matter of you know squeezing things it's a matter of rethinking how they're you know um, positioned on the screen how they cor correlate to one another um, there's some people like you know Oliver Richtenstein from the information architects you know this is this is one of the tools called IA writer and he thinks about the um, 
distance from the from the from our eyes to the screen. So there's a different distance to the to the big you know 27 inch monitor, to the iPad, uh, to the iPhone, and how this correlates to the to the size of the topography or maybe even to the grading. Um, so this is obviously no example of topography called century expanded. And we can see how, how this is uh, an example of all responsive topography. So when one type was very small um, and very large, like 72 points, it has different grading um, to basically compensate for kind of te technical printing issues, to compensate um, for all the printing devices. This was you know, prior to kind of 300 dpi offset, basically to improve readability. Um, the same people at iWriter are doing this um, on digital products. So I don't know how well you can see, I mean, you cannot see on the deck. Um, but these are three different grades of, of the same typography. So they went to this effort of um, having like two iPads, which are the, ex the exact size, but one of them is Retina and the other is not. And basically having different um, fonts for each one that kind of compensates for this uh, resolution. And obviously, you know, thinking about kind of the, the optimal number of characters in a line, um, so between 45 and 75, um, and the responsive layout can work, but it needs to kind of follow these basic topography principles. Um, there's some interesting examples. This is um, from a friend of mine, uh, a very kind of famous Croatian UX front-end developer uh, called Marko Dugunic. Um, Maras is his website, and this is um, a responsive topography demo that correlates with the camera, so with the position of your face. So depending on how far you are from the screen, and it obviously kind of takes this info from the camera, it changes the size of the topography, so it kind of um, relates to your position. Um, we don't have audio, but this is to kind of think about responsive in, a, in, in, in different categories. So thinking about what it means to, you know, responsive to me, to you, um, to art, to architecture. Um, and, and this is a person that's, you know, going to work, obviously kind of very old uh, um, candid camera example. And there was a second person going in, facing the other side, and now he's a little bit confused, you know. And then you have the third person facing the other side. And what does he do? What is the natural reaction? Of course, he turns the other way. This is an example of a responsive person. And in art, every artistic movement is a response to the to the prior one. Um, and when we when we you know went through kind of the responsive web design examples, um, we were always talking about you know changing the content from one medium to another. Um, and basically, uh, I feel this connection is really interesting. Um, and then you have how how. Uh, how responsive kind of art is to, to body movement, um, how art is responsive to digital body movement, and this has amazing, I need to, I need to come closer so you, there's a special moment in this video. Wait for it. It's a very fun website. Um, it's a useless web is the is, is the web called, and then you just have like a big button, give me a useless website, and this is like one of the one of those um, in the index. And then you have one of my favorite um, art installations. This is from 2012, um, the rain room. It was originally. Um, placed in um, in Barbican in London, um, and then switched to MoMA to New York. And this is an example of a responsive installation and how it responds to our position in the room. Um,
I'm just gonna let it play for a few seconds. And it basically switches off rain when we're walking through the installation. So it kind of is responsive to our physical um, place in this room. how my students um, look at this. So this was an example. Um, they needed to make uh, analog installation um, kind of teaching people about bats and their specific um, characteristics. So this is about you know echolocation. Um, and what they did is a very you know rudimentary but uh, a successful example um, of a responsive interface, so of a path that's just, you know, um, very kind of filled up with um, like paper bags, like crunchy paper bags. Uh, and then it, when you walk, you kind of, it's dark, but you know where you need to walk because the path is basically um, audio sensitive. So how mediums change? So how, how things change from one medium to another? Um, this is a TV series called Ways of Seeing from the 70s uh, that teach about art, how to see art, how to think about art. Um, and what's the innovation here is that the kind of the book layout is trying to take the TV experience and kind of put it in a, in a, into a printed um, form. Um, so this is this is kind of you have the you have the big uh, artwork on the right, but then you have like text that displays it, and then just kind of focuses on zoom points, and then just one sentence and focuses on different points. So it's not like a standard book where you have um, the artwork and then it says figure one, uh, Renaissance painting, and then you you know you are reading on the left and then you switch on the right, but it has like this linear uh, flow. Um, if you were to go to celebrate Chinese New Year in New York, uh, you would need a map similar to this, so where the kind of you know parade is going, uh, where's the starting and any an ending point. This is a kind of very similar image, um, a simple image, and it's interesting how this looks like in the digital space and in the and in offline space. So. There were so many people on the website that the website obviously crashed. And there were so many webs uh, people um, in the parade. And I love this you know, difference between those two, how the, how the website is non-existent, white, without content, and how the kind of physical space is colorful, with people, you know, joyful, um, and how Basically, the website responds to kind of this event, to this you know eight-hour time frame um, when there's so many people that you know streets are overfilled and websites are overfilled as well. Um, how things translate from physical space to kind of websites. Um, this is a um, Czech and Slovak pavilion from the Venice Biennale, which just opened a week ago, and how the big imagery that's kind of printed in the pavilion and how this is portrayed in the website with the kind of footnotes, small footnotes, but when you uh, interact with them, it, they take over the entire screen. What are some people doing in architecture? Uh, what does responsive architecture mean? So this is a, a house, play house in Illinois uh, that changes its color of the um, outside, you know, from white to black, changes um, the shape a little bit, kind of expands, and this is uh, all um, in regards to kind of having a sustainable house. And how things can, you know, influence from print to digital, but now things are going backwards, so from digital to print. So how the great discontent uh, was brought to, to print. Um, and the idea is to kind of think about the software not being responsive enough. enough. 
So we're not only talking about obviously screen size, um, but an uh, entire range of contextual information. And I'm going to go through um, examples for like a plethora of info, such as you know, where am I? What's my goal? Uh, what did I do beforehand? And how did I really react in, in, in similar situations in previous months? Um, an idea to kind of design responsive experiences rather than responsive websites or responsive apps. Um, so we have a lot of kind of scenarios, you know. Um, so let's start. I think there were 30 scenarios. I think that's a good number for, for me as well today. Um, so obviously our software needs to be responsive to our location. This is anywhere from, you know, um, micro location to micro location. Um, kind of the first task uh, that I give my students is to design uh, a simple app that kind of helps you in your experience um, in the city you were born. And they need to use something that's kind of specific for the mobile device, obviously, you know. Um, not designing a, a website but an app, so it feels like an app. Um, and the first thing that everyone jumps to is uh, geolocation, obviously. And this is very uh, natural, you know, having geolocation kind of burnt into everything uh, there is on the phone, on the on the OS. So I was thinking, you know, how the Passcode lock uh, is a feature that kind of enables us to have our phone secured, to not have strangers enter our phone, and it's and it's kind of troublesome to enter the passcode lock when you're home, when you're in a safe zone, um, and this is obviously an, an almost year-old example, and it's and it's possible on Android. Um, but it would be great if, you know, passcode lock was location sensitive. So if you were to say, when I'm at these three locations, just don't ask me about it. Like, don't bother me. Um, location can be a little bit tricky sometimes when it says that Google Now isn't available yet in your country. Uh, so how, how, the, how that responds to the location. It can be fairly primitive, so, you know, Delta can tell you that you've arrived somewhere and like share this on Facebook because you want to you know, share this through the airline company on Facebook, obviously. That's like your primary uh, reaction. Um, and Apple is doing, uh, is trying to do a lot with kind of location based um, um, apps which are, you know, in time. Um, prior to iOS 8, this was done through um, just geolocation. Now it's done, you know, through beacons, so so geofencing. So it can be done in interior spaces um, when you enter a shop, when you enter an airport, when you're near a location. Um, uh, for instance, when you reserve a room on Airbnb. And then when you're near, it kind of opens up, you know, it has in the lower left corner the Airbnb app. Um, and this is a feature that's, you know, a lot of people still aren't aware uh, that this exists. And there's you know, good potential for this, especially in regards to other devices. Uh, such as the Apple Watch. So basically, when you watch, when you're doing something on the watch, um, you have this icon on the phone um, to kind of continue the experience on a, let's say, bigger screen. How are we responsive to user needs? So our apps have features, uh, but users have needs. Um, I use Instagram a lot, and I use it not just to view photos, but also to research locations. So if I were to research kind of a new uh, cafe or restaurant in New York, I use Instagram for that. And um, to find out, you know, where your kind of users you're following are, are posting uh, photos, it's a very tricky process. So it's a process that includes 16 steps. Um, 
So let's quickly go through them. So I need to find the user manually, go to go to his map, obviously pan to the right uh, pan to the right continent, pan to the right city, uh, zoom in to the city, try to understand where I am because there's no kind of relative <laughs> information to my location. You know, zoom a little bit, find the batch of photos, open up one photo, press the little eye in the corner, and then have the location uh, below the user's name. So that's kind of the current process of 16 steps. And our kind of very simple proposition is to take this Explore tab, which has been very... Um, its potential has not been used um, very good in the past. Um, previously, it has just been like popular photos were, which were kind of bikini selfies and low light um, cocktail photos. Currently, the Explore section is a little bit better because it kind of gives you um, recommendations based on people you follow. This could be easily done with just adding kind of uh, a navigation, you know, just explore nearby and just show me photos nearby me. Um, and the whole point is that the data is already there. So, you know, the app knows who you're following, where current location is, where the location of the photos of the people you're following. Um, and this will be a very interesting kind of photo exploratory way um, of finding new, new places. Since the data is already there, there are interesting apps such as Density, where you can follow certain locations, and then it tells you when a location uh, has you know low traffic, so you can go for coffee there or to work there. Uh, and bear in mind, this is a very kind of U.S. specific scenario. This is maybe weird from you know for us Europeans to kind of think think about this way is like because although you know coffee houses are overflowed and people are you know with laptops working and no one is giving you um power outlets because otherwise you will be in a coffee house for like the entire day and work there. Um but the data is already there and this for a specific scenario this works really well. What kind of the need to conglomerate um, digital products that are going out every day. So this is Product Hunt, um, and there is a need to kind of follow all the products that are coming out daily, and to kind of have a feedback loop between people um, and founders, and just to kind of research the most interesting products every day. So Product Hunt is great, it's, you know, what, um, Every, every new product, uh, you know, dreams about being featured, basically uploaded on the, on the product hunt. Um, so if you don't know about it, definitely take a look. Um, responsive to kind of needs, the, the, the niche about habit creation is very popular, and calendars have not been redesigned in a while now, and this is um, a proposition to kind of combine those two. So basically combine, you know, creating a new habit with a calendar, so kind of putting um, putting the time, a, a slot for creating a new habit in your calendar, and this is Timeful and, and a calendar app that's recently been acquired by, by Google. Um, responsive to context. So basically, currently every app is like a divided experience, like a very you know boxed out experience. Um, and if I'm performing a search on let's say Google for like um, the best burger in Berlin, and then I switch immediately to Foursquare, it would be nice to kind of translate this knowledge a little bit. You know, maybe prefer the uh, the input field or open up the location which I was you know, currently looking at, just get some context and kind of connect different app experiences into a single user experience. Um, Google now, you know, know where you are, where you're heading, and how long it takes you to there, so it kind of tries to merge this info. 
sometimes it fails obviously because it's very hard to check in the hotel prior to my Frankfurt Riga flight, right? This is kind of shifted wrong, so there's a lot of this kind of intelligence layer which is still missing um, from these tools. How the apps are responsive to history, so you know what we did previously, what we do with an app every day, every week, every month for a while. Um, so one keeper I use a few times uh, a week. And usually when I run, I run with like three people tops. Um, and what one keeper gives you is a list of like all your Facebook friends. And then you need to kind of scroll through the entire list and kind of find the person you're running with every other time. And it's like, you know, having these small kind of additions to, to, to apps which are really kind of established. So this is, you know, Foursquare, Instagram, OneKeeper. These are apps that should think about kind of saving us this, um, these seconds, you know, because otherwise we'll switch to some other um, app. So, so kind of featuring recently used or just, you know, maybe pre-filling it and kind of, oh, it's Saturday morning, you usually run with Mateo on Saturday morning, you know, maybe pre-fill it and then give the user an option to kind of cancel or undo that. Um, responsive to people, so Nuzzle um, is a great news app that kind of takes from your social uh, circles and basically um, features all the articles that have three or more people recommended. Um, so when you open up, it's, you know, the first news is um, by six people, six people. So it kind of gives you very good um, info in regards to what you need to know. Or just responsive in terms of you know how people think about passwords, how people talk, you know, try how you bump. Maybe helping your mom to understand how to make a password because I, I really fail at that. It's just like one child's name, second child's name, is that good enough? No? Okay, then we'll put one and that's perfect. The most secure password. How the systems are responsive to ecosystem, uh, like um, ecosystems. So this is a prime example of you know when I when I got really angry and I can, I can screenshot. So this is a Gmail app. Um, it says try the new inbox app by Gmail because you use categories like social and promotions, which I don't because I have a different view on Gmail. You are invited to try inbox which I already have installed on this phone, to organize your email even better, which I don't need because I have zero inbox and my inbox is always empty. So this is kind of the, the what this kind of breadth of uh, you know experience and knowledge this app has a lot about me, what it offers. It offers something um, which is completely irrelevant to me. Obviously the ecosystem, you know, with the continuity, they're trying, it doesn't work well, you know, your, my computer rings um, and then I press decline and then it rings for five more seconds. Uh, now there's going to be one more device that's going to you know, ring as well, so it's very interesting. Responsive to user patterns, so how, how do we use certain types of um, apps and how we should design experiences to uh, facilitate that? So when I try to give a uh, free app on the App Store, it gives me this error. Error! Giving free items is not allowed. Thank you, app. That's why you, you know, you gave the big, um, kind of gift button on the, on the app. Um, and this is like in, 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 in life. You cannot give something that's free, right? You cannot pick a flower and give it to someone, which is what I wanted to do in this specific scenario. It doesn't care. Foursquare, so on the left you have a location which is closed, on the right you have like a normal location. A normal location has the saved uh, indication, which means you can unsave a location. The permanently closed location doesn't have any way for you to unsave this. So this is on your, on your lists forever. 
they just removed kind of yeah it's a, it's a closed location let's just remove the top bar no one needs this kind of leave a tip rate check in save ah, but it's like if we move three buttons what are we going to do with the fourth one so it was, it was easier Periscope, the most notifications I've had like in the past uh, month. Um, and this is uh, a chef a chef I follow. And whenever I tune in, people are usually doing this. It's just, hi from Croatia, hi from Riga, hi from Portugal. And it's like, there's obviously kind of a, a user pattern where everyone tells the location. Can we just kind of bake this into the UI and just kind of display the location or display the flag, flag and just have some mini, meaningful content rather than kind of um, talking about locations. Google does this well. When you search for, you know, British Airways 115, it gives you the info, like, on a card, which you started doing really aggressively um, a few months back. Or if this, then that, we just rolled out uh, with a series of new apps, so uh, do phone and note apps, which help you to kind of do some um, really customized quick actions similar to this one. So responsive to hardware, this is an example from my company. This is the Ministry of Sound, the UK electronic label company. Um, and, you know, how, is, how, how the experience changes from one hardware to another and how it's not just about fitting screens, um, but it's, you know, really changing the experience. Um, obviously, with Apple Watch, uh, this reflects the content. Um, so we just had, uh, in our last meetup, we had speakers um, from USA Today um, that mentioned how people are changing, how editors are changing the way news headlines are being written. So it's not, so it's longer than a classical headline, but it's shorter than a, a lead into the article. So something that could be scrolled on the small device um, and obviously giving you kind of this save to phone uh, functionality. Responsive to, you know, the hardware and to location and what Amazon is giving you, it's five minutes already, uh, what Amazon is giving you like a one push um, order for very specific um, items such as Tide. Very important how it responds to the brand. So brand is everything from, you know, obviously the name, the visual identity, guidelines, but then more important to kind of the interactions, the animations, the iconography, the color, um, and the tone of voice. So this is time hop. Um, it gives you what happened on this day, one year, two years, three years back. There's no navigation. There's just what happened on this uh, particular day. And the icon, the um, little guy is the dinosaur. And then when you put a refresh, he kind of comes out with a spinning wheel. This is an example of ours again. It's um, it's a farm to table app. You basically um, order directly from the farmers, and then we give this organic feel with the with the icons. So how they squiggle when you scroll them. How they I mean they're not circular, but how they squiggle. So the, the squiggle. Small moments of delight that add to the um, to the experience. Or tone of voice. So sleep bot is an app with which you track sleeping, but then when you don't use it for seven apps, seven days, it's not like, oh, you haven't used the app in seven days. It tries to be kind of funny. Like, wow, you really haven't slept in seven days? Uh, to try to kind of provoke you a little bit. How it's responsive to time, uh, an app loved by developers, and I use it as well, uh, Flux, which uh, basically changes the color of the screen based on the time of the day. One minute, which kind of um, calls out a uh, notification in a different time of the day, uh, invites you to take a photo, and then just kind of merges uh, this into a single experience. How it's responsive to emotion. We're going to uh, have to wait a little bit for that, but it's, you know, coming. Um, the apps, the empty states can be negative or positive. Um, 
if there's no kind of info that you know Swarm can give you when you check in, it, it can just say you know, Happy Friday. Um, City Mapper is one of my favorite apps. It gives you um, results how to get from location A to location B by bus, rail, rain safe, and then it has a jetpack. Just because it's at the end of the screen and it's going to be a moment of delight, something you're going to experience and share and make you love this app. How our apps respond to our bodies? Um, so absolute things count down to my 21st birthday is I have 62 years left and 11 months. So maybe this is a bad example, but a good example is um, one button order. So it's like how many people, you know, what you want, and then just I'm hungry, and then just order. On a more serious note, apps that are responsive to our bodies are here and now. And it's just a matter of uh, kind of merging everything into a more seamless experience. So, so you know, bringing in temperature into the into the wearables like blood pressure, glucose, hydration. This will help us. You know, we won't have to manually enter how much water we had in an, in an app like we do currently. How it's responsive to content. So. Um, Luca is uh, an app with which you can uh, exchange messages and you text to kind of uh, find out about restaurants in the Bay Area. How it changes to content. So these are examples from Bjork and Radiohead and how their apps look like. How do you, how it responds to? So I'm at 14. Sorry. How it responds to trends. So. You know, Obviously, having the weather in a calendar. How it responds to trends, how previously we could see which of the apps are Facebook apps, which are kind of the, the default our apps, and which are like third party. Currently, it's all being merged, and there's no kind of divide between them. Just to think about, I have to kind of run through the, these last few slides. Um, how we think about you know trends like flat design and how our websites look like currently. Uh, if we have any Breaking Bad fans in the room, this is an app called Yo Bitch, which is uh, a play on the Yo app, um, a very famous phrase from one of the characters um, in the series. And basically, I threw a lot of things at you. Um, and these are things that we, you know, we'll need kind of gradually to implement. But it's just an idea to think not about screen size, but to think about all of these different things that we need to have in mind where, when we're designing, you know, proper intelligent uh, digital experiences. And three quick laws, like um, the three laws of interaction design that could help us. So an app shall not harm our work like it does now because it doesn't save, save what we did. The app shall not waste our time because the you know, search doesn't work well and we need to use Google. And most important of all, and I think this is you know, what kind of connects it, uh, the app shall be humane. Um, and this is, you know, from a business standpoint, this is what will, you know, break or make things because, as Luke says, this experience is going to be painful and this is going to be a breeze. And this is the app I'm going to use and this is the app I'm going to give my um, money to in the end. So these are the three rules. And to conclude, I think that polite software has common sense and that polite software is responsive. So when we're designing something responsive, it should be using our common sense. You know, like our mom does. Our mom has common sense. When we were, we had a bad day, she's not gonna cook us something because it's Monday. She's gonna see that we had a bad day and that it's raining outside and she's gonna cook something that's kinda proper um, to that scenario. Responsive are just intelligent 
interfaces software. Um, and in a world where we we're talking so much about mobile first, mobile first, can we finally start designing smart first um, and phones later? Thank you very much.